This is Bill Andrelitis, and he's going to talk to us about the progression of bearings in outboard motors from the turn of the century to now. So here we go. And we are at the um, Museum of, of Lincoln Davis in Waldoboro, Maine. Um, but we're going to talk about um, kind of the history of bearings pertaining to outboard motors. And this first example is not outboard motor bearing, but it's a really good example of what's called a Babbitt bearing. This is a mid-20s uh, automotive uh, piece. And it's very typical of the technology from about the earliest times of gasoline engines. Um, and it's, it was very popular Babbitt bearing is actually cast into this forged steel connecting that rod. That 1907 design Faro engine in my old boat had Babbitt bearings, right. poured Babbitt bearings. And the reason why they used a nice, soft, slippery, tin-based Babbitt bearing is because the crankshafts were soft steel instead of hardened steel. And were they cast or were they? They were forged. Forged, yeah. okay, but and, they were soft. And the, the 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 idea was that having a soft crankshaft would mean that it would not be brittle and would be able to last a very very long time, and that was actually quite true even today. That uh, the, the crankshaft sees so much hammering from the explosions of the combustion that it uh, it needs to be very soft, uh, like say ductile steel that uh, is not prone to fatigue cracking and I think we see examples of crankshafts that have been broken due to fatigue. So anyway the, the technology of the day was soft, very soft Babbitt bearing and a soft steel crankshaft and with good lubrication that was a kind of a forever situation and the only failures really would happen due to accident of uh, uh, dirt or uh, incomplete lubrication or something, but it's actually quite a, a hydraulic bearing is actually quite a nice system. Hydraulic control. bearing, you're saying? Yeah, so that's a, a, a hydraulic bearing is, is one without rollers, it's not a ball bearing, it uses oil as to, it's... As the friction roller in between yeah, yeah, the right. two surfaces. Yeah, right. But they all do that to some degree yeah. too, even okay. to this day. That's yeah. Oh, for sure. It, it's, right. uh, I mean, if you look at modern engines, how many RPMs? And one of the pluses to modern oils is that they have longer chains right. that have a that stay together. The yeah. shorter the chain yeah. becomes, the closer the metals get, and the more the possibility of and, and the getting overheated and that scored. That chain intact right. is is really uh, under extreme heat and pressure is really an important thing, and that's that's what they do. Okay, that's why some of these race cars can. Plain bearing again, not not quite Babbitt anymore, but um, it's a you know I guess the latest bearing is maybe like an aluminum material. Okay. Um, and and those things can withstand unbelievable abuse and pressures and speeds and uh, it's just it's just amazing. But the key is that they have forced lubrication to that bearing all the time. And that's okay. That's a key piece that we're going to talk about a little bit later in, in this discussion. So, okay, so now outboard industry starts. Um, Waterman being, you know, the real first successful gasoline okay. outboard motor. That is all plain bearing engine. And that uh, is a little bit different in design than what we're talking about here. That, that design is a plain bearing engine, but because it has a connection to motorcycle technology of its day, the flywheels are actually in the crankcase. So we go over and take a look at that. Sure. You're talking about. Yeah. We're talking about this. Yeah. Crankcase right here right. has the flywheels very inside. Motorcycle-like from this time period, and uh, so the the crankshaft. He bought these wheels. engines originally from Curtis Wright. I think. So, which I was think a so. motorcycle engine. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So this inspiration for this design was really motorcycle. So the, the crankshaft is basically discs with a crank pin 
fastened together, which can be disassembled. Um, and that has a plain bronze um, bushings. Okay. Um, but, of course, when Ole Evernew designed his rowboat motor, which is like this one, I mean, this is a, a later example, um, but the, in 1910, when the Evernew went on the market, it, it was similar to this. It was a single cylinder. So that used a, a forged crankshaft like this, um, soft, not hardened crankshaft. When you're talking about hardened, you're talking about hardening the surface, but not right. the internals. Yeah, that was the, the breakthrough that we'll talk about okay. soon. Um, right. So that was a that, soft, that would be a soft, yeah, but not, forged, right. but soft. Yeah, so right. this crankshaft was, maybe one would say it was heat treated, but heat treated to remove stress. Okay. But not, right. not right. its har surface hardness was not okay. altered. So that's the crankshaft. The connecting rod was um, cast bronze uh, connecting rod. It's not Babbitt. It's cast, a, bronze yeah, cast bronze in the whole connecting rod. That right. was the easiest it's, way, not right. to bush it or There's anything no like that. no insert bearing or right. anything. It's just the, the connecting rod. So it's a hard bronze. Yeah. Right. Yeah, okay. So, so this system worked really, really well um, for the robot motors and the RPMs and speeds that they, they were used. Uh, fairly low pressures and low RPMs. I think that an Evernew robot motor, I don't I think they were rated around 1,000 RPM or something, 900 RPM maybe. 1910, that would have been fairly high speed, yeah, oh yeah. actually. Oh, yeah, compared to yeah. the big, uh, like, single-cylinder inboard engines of the time, you know. That. In 1910, the inboard engines, a high-speed inboard engine was considered 800 RPM or greater. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, so that was the technology for quite some time. Okay. So, now we've, we've talked about the um, Evernew robot motor um, quite a bit here, and basically this this technology persisted through the teens. And many robot motors use this exact same setup: Kale, Lockwood Ash, uh, Wisconsin. I'm not going to name them all. Are we talking basically one cylinder engines? Yeah. Basically. How did they all perform? Did they? Did anybody figure out how to counterbalance those things? I mean, I ran at Wisconsin. It was. I thought it was going to rip the back of the transom yeah. off. It seems like the Evernote <coughs> were the were the best. Okay. Um, I've seen Lockwood Ash motors really shake pretty bad too. So Evernote, I think, had it figured out. Um, to, to, of course, the as you see, the crankshafts are not counterbalanced in any way, but. If you look at the flywheels on some of those, um, on the Evernudes, there is a counterbalance weight okay. in, inside the flywheel. Um, on the original battery um, ignition uh, uh, flywheels, you can actually see it's cast in, into the cast iron flywheel. The magneto, flywheel magneto um, examples, like over there, one of the shoes, um, magnet shoes in the flywheel is heavier than the other side. Okay. Yeah. So, very good. So, Ole Evernew was very aware of, of uh, trying to balance these things, and it's well known that single cylinder engines are, you know, not as smooth as, as others. So, so okay. Now we're moving through the teens. Okay, everything's going good. World War One comes along. New advances in aluminum and some metallurgy, and of course, there's always the pressure to get more horsepower out of engines. Aircraft industry is developing um, along quite well. And um, the two breakthroughs, of course, everybody knows the, the history of, of Ole Evernrude and the Elto outboard motor, the Elto light twin, or rudder twin as it's called, with all that use of aluminum. Does and, that, would that be this yeah. first engine right here? Yeah. That's not the very first one, but it's, it's an right. example of it's what example you're talking about. Typical. Okay. The, the big breakthrough, okay. of course, is that now it's lighter. It makes more horsepower. It 
spins faster. So I think these were rated at 1300 RPM, something like that, or 1400 RPM. It starts really causing some problems with the bronze rods, bearings, and crankshafts. So this is an example of early use of case-hardened crankshaft. So somehow in through the teens and the Johnson brothers recognized that very early on when they were developing their um, water air, aircraft engine oh, okay. stuff right. and their race boat engines that they, they really came to a place where they realized the limitation of a, a dead soft crankshaft and a plane bearing. So basically we're talking the difference between a 1,000 RPM engine and a yeah. 2,000 RPM Somewhere engine. Right At 2,000, we're starting to, yeah, yeah, the phosphor is beginning to, the phosphor bronze connecting rod is beginning to wear yeah, very down. heavily on a, yeah, on, a, a soft crank. on a soft crank. Right, right. Okay. So Ole comes along, I don't know if I can credit Ole with the, that, you know, being the first guy to case hard in a crankshaft. Probably not. The Johnson brothers were probably the first, and in the teens they came out with that Johnson motor wheel engine, which was the predecessor to their great flight twin. But that motor wheel engine, they realized, um, should have because of the RPMs, and those probably were over 2,000 RPM. I think these were 2,200 or 2,400, something like that. It became essential to have a, a, a case hardened crankshaft. So that's taking this soft crank right here right. and taking the uh, surface of it and hardening it, but right. keeping the ductile that's soft right. internals. That's the big breakthrough. Okay. Is, is to have right. the, the, the advantage of uh, ductility of the shaft and um, not having it become brittle, if you harden the whole crankshaft straight through, it would. Uh, it would certainly break. It wouldn't right. stand the, the wouldn't pounding. Stand no. Okay, all right. Um, so, so the Elto was an early example of um, an outboard with a case hardened crankshaft. The Johnson really, I think the breakthrough came with Johnson and the Johnson motor wheel with, with the uh, hardened crankshaft, still with a, a bronze rod, not very different than, than this one. Um, so now we're in the 20s and speeds are going up and up and up. So certainly early 20s, maybe 2400 RPM, Elto still at 13 or 1400 RPM, something like that. Uh, right around 1925, there were also changes in size of engine and horsepower. That's when the kind of the 20s horsepower race began. That's when the manufacturers said Johnson was crazy. To come out with Correct. the P30, this yeah. thing, right? This, yeah. big, this was, this was the 450 Verado <laughs> of 1925, yeah, right, right, right. right? Even though it's a 26 engine, it came out in right. 25, and it it would actually plane a boat. That was the breakthrough. Um, case hardened steel crankshaft, bronze rods, cast iron pistons, but could withstand the RPM all day. Yes, and reliably as well. But it's hard to think of this engine as being the monster that all the other manufacturers thought it was. They thought Johnson was crazy to come out right. with this yeah. huge engine. Yeah, but it was very, from an engineering point of view, a very progressive company. They were they were pushing the edge all the time. So that's, uh, and you know, the history of this company shows that every year they had some breakthrough technology. So 